Welcome. This is Rolf Versluis, known on the Discord as Block Ops, and uh, welcome to everybody in the Zencash community. We've got a, our bi-weekly live stream update here, and as usual, we're going to have um, Rob Viglione uh, talk through all the different slides, unless there's connectivity issues, in which case I might jump in and talk about uh, other things, uh, uh, talk about the slides as well. So. Um, Looks like the live stream stabilized out on YouTube. So, Rob, I'm going to hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Rolf. And welcome, everyone, to our biweekly update on June 13th, 2018. Uh, this is an important one, given recent events. So just going right to the big picture, um, you know, bottom line, guys, we are, we are back in bear market territory. So this is always a fun place for us to be. Uh, what it means is that we uh, have to go back to being scrappy. And we are no strangers to this, so we plan on just powering right through it, uh, regardless of whatever happens to the market. So we'll do the usual updates here, starting with our business development. Then we'll get into some really interesting development updates. Um, this is where we have kind of an action-packed view of some really nice, um, nice uh, things that we've been working on. And then we'll go into the secure node system updates, the R&D, since we've been making a lot of progress there and then turn it over to Rosario for marketing, and then we'll do our regional activity. So moving right along to our community member highlights. So you guys, everyone tuning in here, I am, I'm very sure that you've heard about the 51% attack. What you don't or you may not know of is what was going on in the background. And Hellcat Z, I used to call it call, call them Hellcats. I learned um, in putting this together that uh, the correct pronunciation, guys, is Hellcat Z, um, was actually instrumental, completely hands down instrumental and in leading our kind of quick reaction and triaging efforts to figure out what the heck was going on during this 51% attack. So um, Hellcat Z, thank you so much for everything. Uh, his early analysis on the double spend was absolutely critical um, in helping piece together what was going on and giving us a coherent story so that we can react to it in a very timely manner to limit damage and uh, spin up the rest of the team to do our thing. So um, he's been around in the community since the beginning and just an extremely valuable community member. And he always seems to be there for us when we absolutely need him. Um, so thank you again uh, very much from the entire team for everything that you've done uh, over the last couple of weeks here. Okay, so let's let's dive right into business, guys. We've got, um, let's see, slide four, uh, the first business development slide. We've got uh, a new exchange listing. So we had a, a big wave of exchange listings last uh, live stream, the big one being Binance. Now we have a really cool uh, new exchange to add to the list called BlockBid. And BlockBid is a new exchange in Australia, so I suspect you'll be hearing a lot more from them because they are regulatory approved with a crypto license in Australia. And they are Australia's first insured exchange, which is really important in an age where exchanges are the huge honeypot targets for hackers everywhere. And um, you know, one of the, the big things with parking your funds on exchange is the risk that you have of the exchange being severely hacked and robbed and you losing your funds. So the fact that BlockBid has an insured uh, insurance policy on deposits is absolutely huge. So we're really happy to be pre-listed on their exchange, which is launching in, in August. Okay, and see moving forward on some, so this is um, uh, moving into the development slides here. Um, we, we actually have a, not a new partner per se, uh, InfoPulse, if you guys have been paying attention to us for the last six months or so, uh, we've already been working with InfoPulse, but here's where we're highlighting a huge um, um, you know, step up in our level of engagement with InfoPulse. So we actually have a dedicated team from this company. This is um, one of the powerhouse uh, software engineering companies out of Ukraine. And uh, just a great group of guys with a ton of blockchain experience. That we've already been working with them. Um, so you guys might not realize, but a lot of the, the stuff that we've been doing in parallel, uh, particular hardware wallet integrations. We've actually been doing with our InfoPulse partners, um, but we're stepping up the engagement with them for some critical projects. So um, two of the big ones are, and we'll talk about this more when we get to the R&D slides, but uh, IOHK has been our, our big R&D partner to kind of 
uh, doing the preliminary science and mathematics and prototyping for um, our treasury project, our voting system on chain, and our scaling project. So the, the work from IOHK has matured sufficiently where we're now able to hand off um, big chunks of this to now our InfoPulse partners to start getting work on um, you know, some of the heavy hitting engineering. So we'll talk more about this as we get into those uh, engineering and R&D slides. But moving to slide six, you can see that the powerhouse team that we have from InfoPulse here, because we had to highlight this because I think the relationship that we've had with them previously has not really stressed just the, the uh, extreme talent that these guys bring to the table. And here's the dedicated team. So we have 10 guys from InfoPulse now in their blockchain division dedicated to Zen and, and bringing these R&D projects to production level code. So uh, just going through the list here, you guys can see the engineering management. We have a PhD head of, of R&D supporting us. And then we have just a whole, a whole slew of uh, senior and you know, mixed grade software engineers. Uh, we have um, IT, Q, um, you know, QC testing uh, specialists. So we expect some very um, you know, high performance code coming out of them and extremely happy to highlight this relationship and just kind of moving forward of bringing your R&D now to production level um, quality. So this is what we have going on and just really wanted to highlight just the, the quality of talent that we have um, you know, with, with InfoPulse and the high priority work that they're doing. So now moving forward to slide seven and taking a bit of a step back here. So the, the, the big negative thing that happened to us in the last two weeks that I'm sure everyone here in the community has heard about was our system was you know, experienced a double spend attack or a 51% attack. Actually, let me just first start off by, by commending the team because what we had was we, we knew that this type of uh, mounting risk was out there because other projects had, had experienced similar attacks. So our team was ready for it. And what I like to say is that we, we mounted a sort of um, textbook response to the attack. And that was led initially by, by Hellcat Z, who was the first to really notice what, that something funny was going on with our chain. Uh, and then we spun up um, other, other technical people on our team, uh, Jake and Chronic, big shouts out to them. And then we pulled in actually the, a broader team. And this happened to us uh, early morning Sunday, two weeks ago, UTC time. And um, you know the team worked throughout the night and just gave it a, a really commendable response and effort here. This has been going on essentially nonstop since then. But that very next morning of the attack, um, so our, our marketing and PR teams spun up. They were working through the night with our tech teams, our BD team, our ops team. We were reaching out to all of our major partners, particularly the exchanges, to inform them of what was going on and recommending mitigating actions to contain any damage. So uh, what we did was uh, it worked out really well to contain the damage. But unfortunately, uh, the attacker was able to pull off a few double spends where they were able to kind of make off with some Zen from an exchange partner of ours. Uh, so that was not a good thing, but thank you to everyone who, who participated from the community, the team, Rosario, her team, Lucy, Rowan, everyone that came together and just uh, you know, have, have been doing a stellar job and kind of crisis management here in response. And what I've been doing the last two weeks has been going on you know, radio and YouTube shows almost nonstop to try to dispel some misunderstandings of what happened. So here's where we'll go through some of them. And, and the really big ones, guys, we have to say, number one, the Zencash blockchain is safe. So the blockchain is healthy, it's running, um, and we have mitigating efforts right now to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again. Number two, and this is absolutely critical because there was a big misunderstanding going around. Uh, no new coins were created. So the Zen is not being counterfeited and there is no flood of new Zen um, hitting the market here. So our money supply, our coin supply is perfectly safe and, and not compromised at all. So this is a really big thing for a lot of the commentators out there who thought that we suffered a, an attack um, similar to another network where this actually was the case where new coins were created out of thin air. This is not the case for us. This is not the nature of the type of attack that we experienced. Um, importantly, Private keys and for any of your Zen that you keep off exchange are perfectly safe. So a 51% attack, what it does is uh, an attacker can double spend their own Zen. They cannot steal your Zen. So a 51% attack cannot brute force away your private keys. 
Uh, they cannot steal your Zen. This is just not at all what a 51% attack is. And we have to make this clear to, to the community because I think a lot of people were um, a little bit nervous about the implications of the attack. So uh, the response team, like I said before, did an amazing job just triaging the issue, understanding what it was, and then taking action um, to mitigate the damage. So that thank you to everyone who was part of that. But let, let's go beyond that. Um, so let's go to the next slide, which is slide eight, and talk about kind of the mechanics of what the attack entails. And I'll, I'll go through this quickly because the slides will be available, and then we'll talk about what we're doing about it. Okay, so we have a very good comprehensive plan to make sure that this doesn't happen again and just cannot happen again. Um, but to get there, you have to understand what happened uh, and what exactly about kind of the, the longest chain rule or the Satoshi consensus was violated and how we can repair this. So, okay, slide one of four here that we have about just explaining what a double spend is. So uh, the bottom line is a 51% attack is essentially a malicious miner spending his own crypto, his own Zen, twice. Okay, so the active thread, and, and this is an active thread for any proof of work based coin that uses the longest chain rule. So um, you know, the, the the process here is that under normal conditions, honest miners will just be kind of churning through packaging transactions into blocks and then solving blocks uh, when they find a, a valid nonce and reporting this immediately to the network so that they can claim the reward. What happens in, in um, a 51% attack case is that a malicious miner is, is kind of doing the same thing, but not reporting the blocks that they're solving. So they're, they're, so, they're essentially um, solving a sequence of blocks in private and not reporting this to the chain itself. And while they're doing this is they send some of their own Zen uh, or it could be Bitcoin, it could be any other proof of work mineable coin that uses the longest chain rule, and they send a deposit into an exchange, they trade that deposit for other cryptocurrencies, they withdraw the amount, and then if we move to the next slide, slide nine, uh, step three is the, uh, well, step three is withdrawing, um, you know, funds that they've convinced an exchange are valid. Uh, from the exchange. And then step four is now here is where the malicious miner will inject the sequence of fraudulently mined blocks into the chain. And if you naively accept that the, lo the, the longest chain rule, which means that the most accumulated work um, for any chain will be the valid chain that other miners will start building on top of, then this kind of fraudulently mined in private chain could look like it's the valid, the valid chain. This is exactly what happens. And this, this privately mined chain, um, the one transaction that the, they inject in here is a reversal of their initial deposit into an exchange. And this is what happens. So they've been able to withdraw funds from an exchange and then you know, make null and void their original deposit into the exchange. So this is a theft to an exchange partner, uh, which is a very unfortunate event. Um, and it exploits the longest chain rule from Satoshi Consensus, which has been valid and operating in Bitcoin for over 10 years now. Okay, so, uh, you know, I've spoken, actually, uh, I got a little bit ahead of myself here, and uh, I've spoken through slides three and four of what is a double spend, but uh, you see the sequence here is, um, you know, a malicious miner has to have a, a large amount of hash power to be able to race ahead of the, the rest of the chain in private and then inject all of these blocks back into the chain uh, with the, the aggregate or the accumulated uh, work being greater than the, the honest chain, as we call it. So, so keep in mind here, this is exactly the problem, that an attacker can mine privately without reporting the blocks that they're mining. So there's a variety of solutions to a 51% attack floating around the web right now, and some of them are very good, but I think the very important point here is if, if we just go right to the heart of the problem, which is that an attacker can privately mine a sequence of blocks and, and, uh, without reporting these blocks, uh, if we could stop this process, we could stop the nature of a 51% attack in its tracks. Okay, so that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, let's go to slide 12. And here, here, here's our response to it. So uh, if you look at this, this kind of response pyramid, uh, step one, this is what we did the morning of the attack. Uh, we, we reached out to all of our exchange partners, we informed them that an attack was, was taking place, and we, we uh, recommended that the mitigating action was to increase the number of block confirmations 
before they would release a deposit into their system. So what this does is that previously there were, you know, what what is kind of um, taken as historical or heuristic from Bitcoin is that on the Bitcoin blockchain, for instance, after six blocks, um, you know, being confirmed, it's it's sort of a heuristic where it's almost impossible to reverse this this history and and execute a double spend. Uh, unfortunately, this is no longer the case, it, particularly for um, you know, proof of work mineable coins that have much lower hash rate than Bitcoin. Um, so, what we recommend as the first mitigating step is that exchanges significantly increase the the minimum block confirmation time before they release deposits into into their system. Um, this is what happened. So, uh, with Binance, for instance, they increased the the minimum confirmations from 12 to 120, uh, which stopped the attack um, in its tracks. And on Bitrix, uh, our other major exchange partner, that's the number is 150 confirmations. So it looks like this so far makes it um, fairly costly to try to gamble on one of these attacks on us, um, but it's insufficient in my mind going forward. We have to take additional actions to make the cost exponentially um, higher, and therefore, um, you know, infinitesimally more, you know, uh, more feasible. So. Uh, or infinitesimally feasible, I should say. So step two here in our response is we're actually, Alberto has uh, um, you know, pioneered here a, a novel new solution to appending or modifying Satoshi consensus, this longest chain rule, so that we introduce a penalty mechanism that makes it exponentially harder to mine a sequence of blocks in private without reporting that to the chain. So the core here, and we're actually going to release a, 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 proposed, uh, a proposal to the community tomorrow. We have the paper already done in draft, and we're just polishing it for release. Um, what we introduce here is a penalty mechanism so that any delayed reporting of a block that you find to the network is penalized. And if you try to mine a sequence of blocks, uh, you will have here an increasing penalty for all of the blocks. And the penalty will increase in some functional form that kind of escapes the normal possible simultaneous block find for honest miners. And kind of once, once this, you know, uh, this range of any sort of norm normalcy is exceeded, there's a kind of exponentially increasing penalty for, um, you know, additional delays in, in block sequences that you report to the network. So this is a very elegant change to just core consensus that we inherited from Bitcoin that could solve this for the entire industry. Now, we're, we have to put this in perspective, and I think it's a very um, innovative approach that uh, shows that we're, we're taking this threat very seriously and trying to solve it, being industry leaders to solve this problem. But we're, in, we're releasing this as a proposal to the community because we recognize that there are several solutions already out there to this type of problem. We think that this is the most innovative one to really get at exactly the heart of what the problem is, which is this parallel uh, mining in private. We want to kill this process from being able to happen. Now, uh, this we don't want to stop here. Um, step three is actually um, uh, looking at other solutions that are on the market, what we call a node notarization system um, that inherits. Um, so there's a project called Komodo that does an excellent job of this already um, using something called a delayed proof of work, where they take uh, proof of work, kind of a, a note, um, like a uh, a block stamp from another chain like Bitcoin, which is has significantly higher, um, you know, mining hash rate on it, and uh, uses uses uh, blocks from Bitcoin as a sort of notarization system on their own chain, so that at certain intervals you actually have um, you would have to compromise both chains, not just the Komodo chain and not just Bitcoin. Um, and in our case, we're thinking about a, a again a bit of a novel solution here, either inheriting what they're already doing with the delayed proof of work system, or adapting it to our no, our own node architecture, which kind of de facto layers in um, a hybrid proof of work and proof of stake system that both would have to be compromised in order for this sort of system to fail. So, um, what we have to realize here, and we have to be realistic from a security perspective, is um, you know option number one solves you know in, in many instances any any realistic attack on the system option two with the penalty mechanism is a novel a novel change to kind of core consensus that should really kill this problem because we actually have a module like a, 
a, function, uh, a functional penalty form on there that we could modulate to make the, the penalty as difficult as we want. So in simulations, for instance, we've, we've seen uh, we can modulate this to have, for instance, twice the cost of what it would take to compromise Bitcoin. So this system itself could be massively secure. But then on top of this, we want to layer an additional safeguard just to really kill this thing in its tracks and make sure that this is just uh, both technically infeasible and economically stupid to try to mount one of these attacks on our network. OK, so this was a, a big invention from uh, Alberto Garofolo, who's our director of technology, and Pierre Stabellini, one of our software managers. These guys are absolutely brilliant, and they've, they've put together what we think is, is an excellent proposal for the community that we're going to be releasing tomorrow, like I said. Um, and, and I have to say, we've had added rigor to the white paper through a, a process of peer review, albeit a very short process of peer review. Um, but keep this in context that we're at this stage just announcing a proposal. Uh, and then we're going to be going and running simulations, um, enhancing our simulations we've already run, and then um, coding prototype and then testing this like crazy before we bring it into market. Because it is uh, a change to our core consensus mechanism. And any change to core um, software has to be done in a very uh, rigorous way. OK. So that's, that's a mouthful, guys. Um, let, let's move on to some, some good news here. So slide 14. Well, I, I have to say, I think the, the innovations that Alberto and Pierre have been um, pioneering are very good news for our system and very good news for any proof of work mineable coin. Um, so it's very, very exciting stuff that we're doing here to try to kill this whole 51% attack threat. But let's move towards um, you know, what, what we have going on in the next month here on the engineering side. So the big thing is we, we've actually, we're finally um, uh, converged on a block height, uh, block 344,700, which roughly should fall on July 19th uh, for when we're going to execute our upcoming hard fork that we've been talking about. So this hard fork has a number of interesting features in it, but uh, probably the most anticipated thing, uh, the change here will be changed to the, the block reward in our consensus and the introduction of super nodes. So we're, you know, we, we initially had it in mind that we wanted this to take place a few weeks earlier. Uh, we have gone through a number of events on the project um, that, um, you know, up, up until now, where we're, we're sure that we can do this on, um, on this block and date, um, date estimate here. So um, th this is very exciting news for the community because here's where we're really starting to, uh, you know, shift the economics of the system a bit and then um, introduce some uh, core improvements that are very interesting. So let's go to the next slide on the mandatory upgrade, slide 15. Um, we've talked about this already, but just to recap quickly what the changes are in the block reward uh, structure is we're, the miners now are going to be having 70% of the block reward. We're going to have 10% going to secure node operators, 10% to the new super node operators, and then 10% to the treasury. So besides these numbers just being nice, even, even rounded numbers, the 10%, uh, so the increase from 8.5% eight, eight to 10% of treasury is a precursor because we are going to be, uh, we're planning to implement our, our treasury voting system towards the end of the year. And in this voting system, a big part of the game theory aspect is we want to pay people to vote. And the resources to pay people to vote are going to be coming out of the treasury pool itself. So here's where we have the additional increase to round it out to 10%, um, you know, because most of that will be going towards uh, paying people to vote anyway. So what do we have in this mandatory upgrade? Uh, so slide 16. The, the core features here for Zen 2.0.14, we have a more robust code base and the new node class being introduced. So. Um, the, the big thing from the kind of the, the core software upgrades, though, are we're, we're, in, we're introducing Zcash upstream improvements from 1.0.14 on Zcash, um, which has a bunch of interesting features. So on the Zcash side, from, up, from upstream, we're, the, really, the very exciting thing that Zcash has done that we're introducing here with this upgrade is the low memory prover, which reduces joint split creation for our shielded addresses and the memory usage for it from 3 gigs to 1.7 gigs. So this is a huge performance improvement. It should be really nice from a usability perspective of the network. Um, also, there's some experimental features in the upstream improvements that we're going to be introducing, which really go towards this concept of viewing keys 
where there's a new uh, use case for using the technology where, you know, yes, you can, you can park funds in a shielded address, but there might be some business use cases where you want to have some selective disclosure in terms of viewing that transaction that went from, say, a shielded address to another shielded address. Um, and this is what we call viewing keys. And there's some functions that we're putting in here uh, from Zcash that are experimental right now on payment disclosure with some new RPC calls um, that just kind of set the, set the groundwork for the, the viewing key system. So that's, that's also very exciting from a usability perspective. Um, some work that we've done uh, on our engineering team is we're, we've introduced a fork manager, uh, which is really nice for any time that we do any improvements, uh, you can look at exactly what happens in the code from past and future mandatory upgrades, uh, and that they're going to be very clearly defined and separated within the, the code base itself, which is just a really nice um, you know, professionalization of the code base where we want things to be very modular and clear and understandable and traceable. Uh, a useful function that we're adding back into is op return, which is our, our null data, which gives us the, the ability to store up to 80 bytes of data um, in an unspendable transaction. So here's where we have some use cases. Um, for instance, something that we talked about months ago of one of our partners, FlowCrypt, uh, is interested in storing uh, PGP public keys on our chain and then retrieving them, kind of storage and retrieval function using our chain. Now, we couldn't do this previously because we didn't have op return enabled in our code base. So this is, it, it, it's a one line uh, fix in the code base, but there's, there's a whole range of business use cases that come from being able to store arbitrary data on chain. Uh, and then also the team's looking at planning to, mer they're planning to merge Zen's Xenom, uh, which is our mining pool software improvements to the Z Classic repository. So we, we know that with this, up, this hard fork, we're gonna have some, kind of uh, interoperability um, things that need to change with Xenon uh, to make it compatible. So this is also part of our planning here in the holistic fashion to make sure that this is a very uh, methodically executed hard fork. Okay, so moving on. Now, um, usability is, is critical for us and something that we're constantly working on on the BD side and on the engineering side. So uh, what we have and we're really happy to announce is Tracer T support, uh, where we want an additional and very uh, well accepted and popular hardware device, the Tracer, to be able to accept Zen. Um, so this is exactly what we've been doing. And actually, our InfoPulse partner has been working on this code. And they're in the final kind of uh, the final test phases where we actually submitted a PR to Tracer. Um, we, we had some, some comments and feedback. We, we took them, we integrated them in. We're testing it right now, and we're getting ready to put, um, do another pull request to Tracer to implement uh, Zen on the Tracer T. So this is really good news for, for the community. And moving along to secure node updates. So I, I, I guess the big news here, uh, guys, is that our secure node count just keeps on increasing. So we're already over 12,000 secure nodes now. And I think um, part of this is a function of the changes that will be implemented in the block reward payouts in July, where we're going to be increasing the secure node payouts from 3.5% of block reward to 10%. So I think that part of this growth is an anticipation of that, where um, secure node operators are going to realize a, you know, a, a two and a half times uh, increase on the Zen payout. Um, so we're, we're starting to see the network grow quite nicely there, and we expect uh, continued growth in the future. Now, one philosophical thing that I want to mention here when it comes to 51% attacks and what we do by um, diverting part of the, the new coin generation um, to different, a, a different stakeholder class of, of node operators is uh, because we are migrating towards a, a stake-based voting system, I think it's even more imperative than ever to make sure that we have as widely of a diffused kind of um, you know, um, coin, coin ownership profile uh, and, and part of this is you don't want one company, for instance, to generate some amazing hardware that just dominates mining. They do this in private, and then they accumulate a disproportionate amount of Zen, and then they could use this to vote on how resources and decisions are made on the network. Um, by having a, an, a different type of uh, stakeholder receiving new coin generation, this just decentralizes our risk even further. So I think this is a really nice, elegant uh, risk reduction mechanism in addition to just um, you know, all of the other benefits that the, the secure and future super nodes will bring to the system. So um, right now we're, we're in, uh, in testing for the super node, um, super node system going live and um, continuing development on the, 
you know, ongoing work for on-chain, um, you know, system design. So this will be an important upgrade to our system coming later this year, where we're able to kind of offload all of the tracking and payment logic um, from off-chain servers to, um, you know, nodes doing the work on-chain. So this is really important for censorship resistance. Okay, so slide 19 is now our R&D update. Uh, so th there's actually been a lot of work going on on the R&D side that uh, I, I don't know if we've been doing a very good job um, publicizing because we're, we're the sort of uh, team that likes to deliver first and then talk about it rather than hype things. So uh, what we have going on with our R&D partners are, so the Dow Treasury voting system uh, prototype has been delivered. I don't know if this has really been made clear enough to the community, but we already have um, you know, delivered code in Scala uh, or written in Scala in the Scorex framework from IOHK. And this has already been handed off to us and to our InfoPulse partners to now um, you know, build the production level code. So this is a really big deal for the project and we're completely on track, on schedule to delivering the, the on-chain voting system that will govern how our resources are kind of decentralized and managed in the future. So this is our big mandate that we've had since day one um, you know, when we talked about in our white paper that we wanted to democratize these systems and continue to decentralize them. Uh, we're doing it uh, and we're making very steady progress here. So this is really nice to see. Now our scaling study with IOHK is also progressing. So this is our block DAG. Uh, protocol upgrade. So this is where we're, we're considering rewriting the entire code base from scratch and organizing the consensus from a blockchain where you have sequential blocks that are mined to a tree architecture where we have um, blocks, many blocks mined in parallel and organized in a tree so we can really uh, ramp things up from a, a transaction throughput perspective and scalability perspective. So scalability entails a lot more than just transaction throughput on your system, uh, but this is the first major part of scalability that we're trying to solve right now. Uh, and it's a really exciting uh, thing. And we started with IOHK uh, researching two academic papers and these block, block DAG protocols, one called Spectre and one called Phantom. The team has converged on Phantom being the preferred protocol. And right now, uh, IOHK is in the, the prototype uh, coding uh, development. So this is really nice news for the project. And our InfoPulse info partners, with, along with IOHK, are looking at a few different side chaining solutions along with their own engineering team. Uh, and we're, we're, nothing's off the table here. We have some really exciting leads on the architecture that we want. Um, so we want something that's just massively scalable. Uh, sort of containerized solution so that if something goes wrong with one of the side chains, it doesn't take down the entire mainnet. Um, and, and some other interesting properties where we want things to be extremely um, you know, fast on the side chains and we want them to be extremely secure. So we're currently analyzing two promising side chaining solutions. Um, you know, a rootstock RSK for the, um, you know, uh, a smart contracting solution and Cosmos, which is a really nice interoperability protocol uh, that we're, we're analyzing, as well as with uh, Scorex framework from our IOHK partners and our own internal um, you know, architecture that we've been exploring. So our approach to this is very scientific and rigorous to analyze all of the solutions currently out there, as well as our own that we're inventing, and try to determine, you know, are, are any of these dominant where we should go with them first, or is some hybrid um, the optimal solution? And the important thing here to note is that we don't have to go with one side chain solution and call it quits from there. Uh, what we're thinking about doing is the first side chain will be, um, you know, the treasury voting system, and then another side chain will be our uh, secure and supernode tracking and payment system. So, but from there, we we can have multiple side chains, and there's no reason to constrain them to any particular programming language or smart contracting solution. So we can have multiple solutions, multiple languages running on multiple side chains. Um, in, in the best case scenario. Now, of course, we're still in just the R&D phase of this stuff, but um, the, the big point that I want to highlight is that uh, nothing in the trade space is off the table, and we have some very promising leads already. Okay, so that's, that's um, you know, all of the really major updates that we have on the BD and, and the engineering side, just recapping what we, you know, what we experienced with the 51% attack and how the team just came together really professionally to mitigate. Uh, and do damage control and how we're turning this from crisis to opportunity and taking a leading, a leading position here to uh, architect a novel solution to try to end this threat for the entire industry. Uh, and then we, we, you know, we talked about the hard fork that we have coming up with the very uh, exciting upgrades and improvements to our core protocol. 
and then all of the fun and exciting R&D updates. Now I would like to stop talking and hand this over to Rosario for marketing. Hey, Rob, those, those were some seriously great updates, and we'll definitely start pushing a uh, message out on our progress with the, the R&D that we've, uh, we've accomplished so far. So that, that's going to be coming forward in our, our messaging. One of our jobs at marketing is to create excitement with engineering achievements and managing expectations when the news is not so good. So this past week, with the double spend, we, we wanted to make sure that we were at the front of communication, keeping transparency and focusing on solutions all while we had active campaigns with our new partners. So we responded to a crisis, as you said, Rob, and kept moving. Our blog's uh, statement on double spend transactions performed the best uh, as any other blog, uh, even better than the April's ICO bunny and Rob ASIC response and both of them combined. So that's, that was pretty amazing. And we're really happy that we are able to provide information uh, to anyone uh, that wanted to learn more about what happened and to dispel any, any FUD, uh, all while keeping our community abreast of, of what was going on. We also reached out to our network of YouTubers to um, provide an educa education mechanism straight from the horse's mouth. And uh, sorry, that's, that's you, Rob. <laughs> uh, but our goal was to educate people on double spans, to dispel any rumors, and to discuss our, our path forward. Uh, during this time, we also published three articles, including blogs. But I'd like to take this as an opportunity to remind folks to ignore the noise and look at our achievements, our actions, conference participation, regional activities, partnerships, workshops in Africa, and all the engineering solutions that we're bringing to the table. So our focus is going to be to uh, make those engineering solutions more visible for our, our, our marketing purposes. So let's forget the noise and, and move forward. So uh, one, on to uh, more good news. Uh, we had great success in expanding our user base. Uh, we're focusing on email communications right now. So uh, we're leveraging our faucet subscribers and Jonathan is, is helping us execute a campaign that guides users into uh, our ec ecosystem. So these are new users that are just recently exposed to Zen. And this, this goes hand in hand with our, uh, with our uh, mantra of usability. So I'd like to thank Jonathan for that. And the upcoming features, uh, yes, you could see Rob here with Rob Lowe from On Demand. And uh, we're really excited to be featured on a mainstream outlet. So the recording is, is set to start in August, and it's going to be a, a series of cryptocurrencies, and Zen is going to be one of them. So this is a great accomplishment for us. Also, uh, be on the lookout for a, an article in The Times. This is one of the largest mainstream news outlets in the UK. So uh, that article is set to go live on June 21st, so uh, keep an eye out. And last, uh, and certainly not least, for this slide, I'd, I'd like to just uh, have some teaser, uh, some small teaser uh, images here on our Zen original comic series that we are develop, developing. Uh, this was developed originally uh, by our own team, Lucy, with the storyline and original artwork by Linda. She's an amazing artist, and Marco with the animations. So be on a lookout for this. Our, our hope is to announce the new white paper that Rob has, uh, the, the proposal for, for the new consensus that Rob had mentioned, with excitement and to demonstrate our grit in our response to the attack, all while having a little bit of fun. So you'll, you'll see this. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. Next slide, please. All right, so June has a, <laughs> been a very, very busy month. Came. Uh, Rowan was in Dublin at Money Conference doing business development. He also had an interview with Kaiser Report. So this is uh, amazing that our PR firm was able to get us that interview. So really thankful for that because uh, we'd like to target that type of uh, subscribers. Uh, we're also sponsoring uh, Cryptolina in Raleigh, North Carolina. Rob is going to be speaking there, and we hope to see some community members in the Raleigh area. Tatiana and Stoic Nate are going to be representing us at Porkfest, so please stop by and say hi. We love to sponsor events that share our, our vision for freedom, and, and this is going to be a fun, uh, fun event. So I uh, hope if, if you're attending, please uh, be on a lookout for Tatiana and, uh, and Nate and say hi. Uh, David will talk more on the event in Tbilisi, so I'm not going to mention much about that. 
And finally, for this slide, uh, we're very, very excited to have both Rob and Rolf at the ZCon conference. And this, this shows our, our, our willingness and excitement to collaborate with the Zcash community uh, as we are highly, highly uh, uh, in line with our, our vision for privacy and our technology reach. So help us share our message on social media. Please like, uh, share, and retweet our posts and help us grow. So this is for our community members, the challenge for you. And if you have a, uh, a meetup or some sort of idea on how to spread Zen around the world, please submit a proposal on our system forum. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Rosario. Um, we have David online to cover the, uh, the Eastern European market. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I mean, I can't help but reiterate the um, excitement of our um, reaction, the way we handled the 51% attack. I think it's actually one of the good things that ha happened to the whole industry because we're not just taking a fixing Zen. We're working on a uh, global solutions that can affect several cryptocurrencies because 51% is not any, by any means specific to Zencash. It's, it's a problem in many others. So I'm really looking forward to um, getting all these short, intermediate, and long-term solutions for for that. Uh, as far as myself, I'm actually chiming in from Eastern Europe uh, physically now. And it, I mean, I, I can't say how much it matters to be face to face. And yes, of course, I had great helpers in, uh, you know, different countries. And, you know, Alex has been great as you see him speaking down there. Uh, but but there's nothing better of, you know, walking in, sitting down with, the, you know, people who, um, who are some serious figures in, in the industry and uh, just having a conversation or even a meal and kind of talking over stuff. So I'll be approaching quite a few uh, local vendors of different sort, especially meeting with institutional clients who are interested, not just in like buying a random cryptocurrency who has a, you know, awesome past, you know, present and, uh, you know, very promising future, but also those interested in technology. I was just brainstorming about different things. And I think if you just take out like just purely our voting mechanism that can be used in so many different um, applications or even in different industries, completely outside of uh, finance and you know cryptocurrencies I mean, that itself has a it's its own market so i think it's very important to um and we all have already done that i'm not saying i'm doing anything new but to kind of open the angle of approach and uh do a far more um cover far more fields than just the cryptocurrency as we are a blockchain platform um so i'll be probably giving you some updates about that now we have this rosario mentioned uh have some really neat conference about blockchain and Bitcoin uh, in Georgia. And that is series of um, uh, such conferences with a very uh, prominent vendor who is doing it periodically, I think every month or maybe every other month in different major um, you know, cities of Europe. And they just picked Georgia where uh, I'm originally from. And I have, of course, a lot of uh, connections and friends. And I was a no brainer to, um, you know, to do that. And I'm very, very fortunate to be able to snatch Rob in between his, uh, I don't know, rally North Carolina and Canada trip for a few days so for him to speak and um i shouldn't be saying this but they even when they heard that he was the one coming not 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 me speaking they actually volunteered to give me a discount for uh, for conference participation so i was like okay well <laughs> you like it right and then then they uh, in addition they actually um what they did um and i'm very thankful for them um they uh gave us a specific slot for an interview about the Zencash. Now this conference is to um, to stay fair to you know listeners and to everyone else. It's mostly about the, the kind of non-branding presentations about blockchain, Bitcoin, et cetera. It's not just to you know get up on the stage and talk about your product, but they actually specifically requested us to give them interview about Zencash. I'm like, sure, we'll do it. So that should be published soon as well. And last but not the least, uh, well, finally, I think it, we may have mentioned in the last bi-weekly, but now all the, um, uh, the media is uh, completed uh, for uh, those conferences and you can actually see the complete video recording for Alex and I was of course I always had high expectations um, for him but he definitely surpassed it and I don't know if I could have done that good of a job so <laughs> anyway I think that's about it Rob back to you thank you David I uh, appreciate that and, and I, I I don't believe you on the whole um, conference discount thing but um, th th thanks for trying to make me feel better. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, let's move on to the Africa slide. Uh, Kenya from, uh, from Hugh. I don't believe the Hugh. Oh, hi, Hugh. hi, Rob. Awesome, thank you. Please take it. <laughs> yes, uh, so an update, just an update from, from my side and a lot of excitement here 
especially being in the African blockchain. That was the first conference uh, held on blockchain in Uganda. This after Binance uh, sort of kind of setting up a partnership uh, and try to see how they can transform Africa. And from this conference, uh, at least we had this good news just the same day we were listed on Binance. So that, that at least was some good news for us. And I'm sorting some partnerships, at least like Crypto Valley, uh, Crypto Savannah, which is an African initiative uh, blockchain hub and tries to transform economic status of Africa. And then we also had a, a secure one workshop from Swarthmore University, ILAB, I think I mentioned earlier, Rob. And the exciting news is that in, in one hour, we had over 77 participants that had some success before the Zcash secure node. So we are planning to have more at the moment. We say we start with 20 participants just to see how it goes out. Uh, just thanks to, to the team from Peter, Nate, uh, Arno, and all the people who joined online. And we're looking for different partnerships in East Africa, also to continue training and most institutions. Also from my side, we have uh, the Women in Blockchain which is a group of women, very aggressive women in Kenya, and they're trying to be in the blockchain space. Some, some have been there for a long time, and they're really looking forward to have Zen Cash and uh, different kind of trainings in Kenya. And I'll be updating you soon. That's, that's it for my side. Thank you. That was such good news, uh, Hugh. Thank you so much for the update. Yeah. And um, let's move on to Luca. Ciao, Luca. Hello. Ciao, Roberto. Can you hear me? Yes. Sounds great. Okay, okay, guys. So, uh, hello, everybody. And um, uh, I have to say before uh, anything else that these slides uh, have never looked so Italian. So, so many names, Italian names written down Garofolo, Stabilini, Viglioni. <laughs> this should make our Italian community very proud. Uh, now, let me give uh, you an update on the main project I'm following at the moment, which is focused on the Zen adoption by merchants and professionals uh, from many different industries and market verticals. So I'm meeting a lot of people in the area presenting the project, and most of them are starting discovering this war. So it's going to be a long-term mission, but I'm very happy to announce some new individuals that decided to believe in us. And basically are starting accepting uh, Zen cash is, uh, the, on the right of the slide. So the, the first is a holistic masseur. Uh, so you can, if you can buy in the area, you might decide to relax and enjoy a massage here. We are speaking of a 65 years old man, completely agnostic to this war two weeks ago, who got extremely interested, opened a wallet, and now started spreading the word. I think this is really amazing. Oh, and by the way, I'm building also a, a landing page to create a map with all the information regarding uh, all the people and merchants accepting Zen. Uh, now that we start having a good adoption, so it will be definitely easier uh, for you to check it out uh, and find all the information. And then we've got an artist uh, slash designer. Also in her case, I'm going to share links and more information. She basically can draw and paint whatever you might need on any kind of material. So if you live far away uh, from the Zen Valley, you come here. Or either if you, if you uh, need something on a digital uh, support, a digital design like a company logo, you will also be ben uh, you, you can also benefit from, uh, from her services. And finally, we've got a financial advisor willing to give financial consultancies to people and companies. Also, in this case, not only in person, but even remotely, thanks to the use of uh, technologies like video chat and co-browsing. And a person willing to offer school private lessons for young students who don't succeed in math. Um, these are services that are now available together with the bed and breakfast to rent, uh, where the website is launching soon. The paintings and portraits you can buy here, the houses you can build and buy thanks to our partnership with Vistali Casa announced two weeks ago. Um, another things to say, uh, I'd like to say, is that uh, many more people are now supporting Zencash from a as an investment, let's say. Uh, so they are now, uh, we have uh, some more people that are now investing in Zencash. And uh, so the base of people that can actually spend 
uh, and use their Zen is, is growing. Um, my goal will be now to involve some big merchants here. Of course, that's more complicated, not only for volatility, but also because typically they don't even accept electronic payments with fiat here. So I'm working on it anyway. And uh, apart from that, I'm being uh, interviewed more, more and more, and I enjoyed a nice interview from Crypto Cryptonomist, which is a, we a Swiss website, uh, basically the most followed crypto website for news here in Italy. And last thing, uh, Tencash is also going to be the first sponsor at the local TEDx this year. So we will definitely have much more visibility in Italy and in particular in the Zen Valley. Uh, I hope it will uh, help us uh, a lot uh, with, uh, with our growth and uh, I'm actually very confident in that. Uh, I'd like to close by also encouraging our community in being active in the Zen revolution because there is a lot of thing, uh, things that people in the community can do. Uh, so the Zen Valley can actually grow also to your help, also where you live, it doesn't matter. Help a person to install a wallet and send a shielded transaction. Show people how to safely self-shield their funds. Talk to people about the need for private transactions. Please do it. Be an active part of this amazing revolution. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Luca. That, that was uh, that was awesome. Uh, I completely agree and echo your sentiments on uh, we really need the community to step up and be part of this uh, movement here. Um, so, um, guys, thank you very much for for chiming in. Uh, we can move to a quick Q and A. I know it's been a while here. We're about fifty five minutes into the, the presentation. So, what, let's see what kind of questions we have. Ralph, do you want to help field these? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we haven't actually had that many questions so far. Um, we have a lot of great updates and uh, sometimes I think that maybe we should be doing these updates not quite as often but then every two weeks we have so many different things to, to share and uh, Luca thanks for making that that point that there's so many things that you know in the day-to-day -day, sometimes we say okay well we're focused on making Zen by mining or secure nodes or trading or things like that but we're not we didn't get into this for the the money and the profits we got into this because there's ways that there's people around the world that need the ability to have private transactions and messaging and it was great to uh, go to the foundation for economic education uh, conference this week in Atlanta and had the opportunity to meet some folks from an organization that I hope that we're going to be able to partner with this is students for liberty uh, dot org and they have uh, students that they work with all around the world uh, to try to uh, emphasize freedom and how to uh, be business owners and develop businesses and I talked to um, the head of it and he said they already pay people in Bitcoin and Ethereum all over the world because banking is tough to do in some parts of the world where some of their students are and I had a chance to talk to him about possibly using um, Zen Cash because of the private transactions and then nobody would be able to see that these people are even getting um, transactions on the blockchain. So those are the types of partnerships and uh, like Lucas said, just show a person how to download the wallet to do a private transaction, to do uh, uh, private messaging because we launched a little over a year ago and our idea was to bootstrap with a minimum viable product and get stronger and better every week, every day, every month and the things like the 51% attack, it's great to get that figured out while we're still growing so that when we're big and everybody relies on us and all sorts of other things um, and, and partnership and people using us, we don't run into those issues. It's, it's the same with the interruption in the live stream today. I added one more thing to my checklist, which is turn off Wi-Fi and plug Ethernet into the wall. That way, I, when I have a Wi-Fi problem, the live stream doesn't drop. So little improvements every day. Um, okay, so we had a chance for people to post some questions. Rob, did you have a chance to look at some of those while I was just sort of talking? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we've got some so a Zen store uh, question. So I actually I don't know if Rosario has a, um, a date in mind for the Zen store launching. So the Zen store is is ready, uh, but we are uh, relooking at our branding. So right now uh, we are. Uh, it'll probably be a couple months. Okay. Um, Let's we'll, see. I we'll see. Get it. back to you guys on that. 
I see a wrong? question about uh, Z9. Are, are we going to do an algorithm change? I know all the miners are, are very interested uh, if we're going to be doing algorithm change for mining. We're still on the same timeline um, as when uh, I put out that blog post, gosh, a, a month or two ago. We're evaluating uh, a possible uh, parameter change to the, uh, to the Equihash algorithm, to the 144.5 parameters. Uh, there's there's good reasons to do that, uh, but we don't have the ability to make a decision on that until after. Well, we don't we don't we don't we're not forced into making a decision. We have to go down the path of doing our next hard fork for all the improvements. We've been doing a lot of refactoring. Uh, we've been doing a lot of Im improvements and testing. And hard forks are big deals. Just like I said in that article, it takes a lot of work for all. Uh, all the people that operate Zencash to do a hard fork. So we try to do one about no, no uh, more often than every three to four months. So um, we have the, we're still evaluating what's going on. There's lots of good reasons to make a parameter change so that the uh, current ASIC miners out there, and there's multiple ones that can now uh, mine Equihash. There's one from InnoSilicon. There's one from Bitmain. Uh, there's uh, FPGA miners that we uh, know that are out there doing this. So um, we don't have a decision to announce on if we're going to do an algorithm change. Yeah, and uh, see so another question here about the code, the code base release for the, the prototype voting system. Um, sorry, JZA, I'm going to have to, JZA where? I'm going to have to uh, defer this to Alberto, uh, who's not online right now, but basically uh, we, we have the code internally that we're, you know, obviously doing our thing in testing after receiving it from IOHK. And uh, we're doing that with InfoPulse that's starting work on the production level code. I, I'm not sure um, what the strategy is on when we're going to release this to our public GitHub repo. Uh, whereas right now we, we have it on a private one as we're working with it ourselves initially. Uh, but really the sequence that we, we typically have, like our, our software engineering cycle is, we, we, we do work uh, you know, on, on our private repo. We have our, our, our uh, dev net for testing internally. Then we release the, to our public GitHub repo and the te public test net. So right now we're still on the, the first phase of this sequence. Uh, okay, thanks, Rob. Let's see. We got some other questions. Great, we got lots of uh, uh, questions. So um, there are uh, people that have an impact on the Zen price. I know that when I look in um, and read in the cryptocurrency press, there's so much focus on prices of cryptocurrencies because that's a really easy thing for lazy reporters to, to vote on. You have to do a little bit more work to dig into listening to interviews or uh, doing live streams or, or looking at, at, at projects and things like that. So price affects us a little bit because we are uh, a bootstrap cryptocurrency. We didn't have an ICO. Uh, we didn't have any kind of pre-mine. And so our monthly budget that we're able to spend on development and marketing and partnerships uh, is dependent uh, on the Zen Cash price. Does that mean that we're going to do unnatural things to drive the price up or, or cry ourselves to sleep every night if the price goes down? No. It's because we know that our, our core uh, activity that we can do is always going to give us some Zen Cash for the community funds. Uh, to be able to spend every month. And so, yeah, if the price goes down, maybe we can't go to as many conferences and let as many people know about Zen Cash in the shorter term, but longer term, everything's going to continue to work out well. Yeah, very, very uh, I completely agree, Ralph. Uh, question on the super nodes. So, on the hard fork date, uh, which was, I believe, July 19th, uh, will super nodes go live and will you be able to start earning on them? Uh, yes, absolutely. So it's not going to be our fully mature system uh, in terms of the, the on-chain uh, tracking and payments, but we are going to have um, kind of a modification to the current tracking and payment system so that we can go live with the hard fork and that 10% block reward is going to be accumulating to a separate multi-sig uh, address will be used uh, immediately uh, post hard fork to supernode operators. Let's see. Um code inputs on the voting system. Uh, we don't, I don't have an answer to that right now. Um, 
how many blockchain developers are working full time on Zen counting InfoPulse and the internal team? Uh, gosh, I would say um, somewhere on the order of between 10 and 20 developers, maybe more. What would you say, Rob? Oh yeah, definitely more than 20 because you have to count the, the crypto particle guys, uh, the IOHK guys, the InfoPulse guys. InfoPulse alone gives us nine software and a manager. So, uh, and then we have our internal guys. So yeah, I, I would say 20 plus easily. Yeah, and that's, you know, and, and then we have people that uh, do pull requests and do uh, issue reporting on the GitHub. So we continue to have community developers uh, and other things like that. So. Um, we do have a lot of developers, and it takes time to develop and test uh, software code. I mean, that's just uh, the way it is. So, um, you know, we would like to have it all magically appear, um, but that's not the way software development works.